So my name is Drew Baden. I'm one of the co-founders here and I run our product team, Mo Data, Mo Problems. I think it's been my LinkedIn tagline for, for a good five years now. Today, we're going to talk a lot about the product foundations. It's clear that DBT struck a nerve and now we need to scale. We're doing that in terms of headcount on our team, new product capabilities and refinements to the existing product that we've already shipped. Part of the scaling involves creating more predictability around what we're releasing and when. And throughout today's event, we'll hear about some of the new and upcoming work that we're researching, developing, and shipping. And towards the end, I'll also be presenting the high-level view of our product roadmap. If you haven't been acquainted already, please meet the Fishtown Analytics product team. Julia has started since the last time we did the staging event. Welcome to Julia. And I think Bar was pretty fresh three months ago, but you're going to hear from all of us throughout the course of, of today's event, talking about what's going on in product. So here's the kind of agenda that we're working with. Bar is going to hop on and talk about the new teams we've spun up here and what these teams are going to be focused on. Jeremy is going to talk about a DBT core and our kind of key priorities. Simon will talk about a more approachable IDE. Julia is going to talk about the future of webhooks. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what's on the way and the high-level product roadmap. At the end of this stream at about 1 o'clock PM Eastern time, we're going to break out into three different uh, rooms for three different topics, and you can choose your own adventure, get some face time with the PMs on our team, and put things on our radar, hear more from us about how we're thinking about different things. So one really important thing before we get all the way into it, to honor the important work that Stop AAPI Hate does to effectively address anti-Asian racism, Fishtown Analytics will be matching the first $1,000 of donations made to this organization. If you're so inclined, please feel free to make a contribution here and send your donation receipt to Fatima at fishtownanalytics.com. We'll drop this link right in the Slack chat. Screenshots are totally acceptable. This is an organization and an initiative that I care a lot about, and I personally will also be matching uh, donations up to $1,000 as well. So that's all for me for the moment. I'm going to pass things over to Bar for us to talk about the new teams at Fishtown Analytics. Thanks, Drew. Hi, everyone. Like Drew foreshadowed, I'm a product manager here at Fishtown Analytics, and I'm here to talk to you today about two new fish in the sea, why we're so excited about two new teams here at Fishtown. So the two new fish in the sea are metadata and CICD. What does that even mean? We've been listening to community members who are using DBT, and we've spun up these two new product teams in order to really focus on some of the pain points that analytics organizations care about most. Our internal bet here is that leveraging metadata and providing better CICD for DBT deployments are key ingredients to further empower and level up the analytics engineer. We were not previously set up to tackle these head on, but now we're putting our resources on these teams to make this empowerment a reality. And we wanted to introduce them and talk a little bit about them today. Uh, so let's get into it and dig a little bit deeper. So I'm the product manager on the metadata team. Here I am. Sorry if this picture is a little narcissistic, but what we aim to do on metadata is empower organizations to share knowledge and make faster, higher quality decisions using metadata within existing workflows. Okay, what does that actually mean? Uh, can't argue with that. So in practice, we wanna meet you where you are. And that means communicating knowledge about your data where it matters the most. I used to be a data scientist and there were so many times when I could have benefited from better metadata surfaced to me in my workflow. I often had to leave whatever I was doing to understand the data that I was playing around with and analyzing, if I could figure it out at all, not always a given. Our idea on the metadata team is that data consumers shouldn't need to context switch and leave their workflows to understand the data that they're consuming. And analytics engineers should be able to easily contribute to the metadata knowledge in their existing workflows too. So the whole point of this is really, it's twofold. The slide gives it away. So one is to empower you largely by bringing to the forefront information that previously was lost or required insights of specific team members. And empowering you means freeing up time for everyone, for data builders and consumers across the analytics org. And then the other is to build trust. So if we do all of this, which we're planning to, we instill trust throughout an organization about the data that's being used to power those decisions. So we're lucky at Fishtown Analytics to have this bird's eye view of analytics workflows. And beyond empowering analytics engineers to create those workflows, 
We want to help them understand costs of their DBT projects, failure rates, and we think that better data discovery, lineage, and provenance are table stakes for, for high quality analytics organizations. If you were at the last staging, you might remember that we launched a beta for a data freshness integration with Mode. If you haven't heard, we've now shipped that to any DBT cloud and Mode user. So you should check it out. The feature upholds some of the values that we just discussed. It meets the BI user wherever they are, so they can check data instead of leaving their workflow. The Mode integration leverages DBT's metadata API to surface data freshness directly in Mode. And the goal of the release is to empower the BI end user and build trust and confidence around insights that can be company-wide decisions. So there's a lot to come in this space. But before we move on to the next big fish in the sea, if you ever want to talk about metadata in your organization with me, you know where to call me maybe on Slack. The next fish is CICD. The new CICD team exists to empower organizations to operationalize DBT deployments with ease and confidence. We have an amazing new product manager in the upper right-hand corner. That's what she looks like all the time. Julia Schottenstein on the CICD team. And you'll be hearing more about what they're up to from her later today. Until then, the goal of this team is really to empower organizations. And that looks like empowering analysts to deploy their code, empowering admins with integrations that fit into their existing workflows, empowering stakeholders to stay apprised and up to date of changes to the data sets that they rely on and make decisions based on. In practice, that looks like operationalizing DBT deployments. So we know that tools are better when they're connected and we optimize for tight integrations with industry leading tools. Sometimes a failed run on DBT can ruin my day. It's happened a few times. We don't want it to ruin your day. And so this team strives to create the context and the actionable insights to help drive corrective action. And when DBT projects are built through our products, you should feel a sense of ease and confidence. Julia is going to talk about this later today, but one recent example of these values coming to life is our beta for GitLab webhooks. Every time you open up a merge request in GitLab, you can automatically kick off a DBT job to build and test your models. This way, you can empower analysts to ship code with confidence in production. This is functionality that's existed with GitHub for a while, and we're excited to bring it to more users with GitLab too. And I know this was an interesting part of staging. We don't usually talk about internal team structure within Fishtown Analytics with the rest of the world. But we really wanted to share these updates with you because we're excited to double down in both of these areas, and we're eager to hear from you as we shape the roadmaps here. And with that, passing it off to Jeremy to talk about what's new in Coreland. Thanks so much, Bar. All right, DBT Core, if they come and you all have come today to staging DBT demo days, we will build it. I'm gonna to try to convince you that your feedback, your input is such an important input into our development lifecycle, our product planning for DBT Core. My name is Jeremy, is he and pronouns. I am the product manager for the core team here at Fishtown. You may know me from Slack, or I am at Jericho. You may know me from GitHub issues. If you've opened one recently, I've probably responded to it, but it's great to be talking to all of you here live synchronously today. Let's talk about what's new, what's next. Earlier this year at the last staging, I told you about 0190 release in January that stabilized our artifacts, which are the crucial input to metadata, a lot of the metadata that Barr was just talking about. In 0191, all the same and three times faster, maybe even a little more in some of your projects. Thank you so much to all of our beta and pre release testers. If you're not already, I would really ask that you join the DBT pre-releases channel in DBT Slack. So you can get early access to some of these in-progress features and improvements and performance fixes and everything else that we want to share from you and share with you and hear from you about as soon as possible. We've got an 0.19.2 release coming out soon. All the same, still three times faster and a few bugs fixed. No complaints there. And we've also got a beta out for 0.20.0. 
which is all about tests. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. All of this is also on the roadmap on the way to version 1.0. Stay tuned. We'll have more to say, more issues with labels to look at as we keep talking later this year. So let's talk core performance and what we've seen the last three months. Every Monday morning, the core team, the engineering team that I have the privilege of working with, takes a look at a dashboard with numbers a lot like these right at the very top. We are deeply familiar and aware of how painful it is to have to wait minutes, let alone more than five or 10 seconds for DBT to parse a project. If you're just trying to run one model, trying to test that model, trying to have an iterative development cycle. And so we are committed to ameliorating the frustration that so many of you have been feeling, have been sharing with us, and it's your feedback that is so essential in making this happen. So the number of projects, users, the amount of lost time that happens just by having to wait for core to parse a project doesn't feel so good. What does feel good is seeing all of you try out pre-release versions of DBT and see parse times go down from a minute to seconds, go down from eight minutes to two minutes, still too slow, but we've got more and more performance work in flight, in progress. So in 0.19.1, our internal analytics project, which is far from a massive project, we're lucky enough now that with partial parsing, it should load in just over a second. That's with 400 file paths. Now let's do the same for projects with 4,000 and with 40,000 file paths bigger and bigger projects that we want to see DBT scale to meet the needs of. This is non-trivial work, and I know a lot of you recognize and appreciate that, and we appreciate that too. Your feedback makes it a lot easier and makes it worth doing. So a lot of the improvements that we saw earlier this year in 0.19.1 came from switching to some really impressive blazing fast Python libraries for serializing and deserializing all of the internal objects that DBT has to manage. You don't have to sweat the details, you just get to benefit from the speedups. We've also got some improvements to partial parsing in the works. That's a feature that some of you may have been aware of and been leaning on for a long time. Maybe the rest of you, it's totally brand new. We're hoping to publicize that a bit more and have many more folks benefiting from this in development. We've also got some experimental work in flight to statically analyze Jinja templates. We'll have a lot more to say and to write about and to ask you to try out over the next couple of weeks and months. If you do want to follow along and sweat some of the details, you can always see us working in public. DBT is open source. Check out issues labeled performance and I'll see you in them. So let's get to the other meat of the matter, DBT test. Hopefully this is a command. This is a task that many of you are familiar with. If you're not, we've got a lot of good blog posts out there, discourse posts, the analytics engineering viewpoint, to talk about how important it is to test your transformations. Test your SQL logic, test your source data. If we can't validate the assertions, the expectations that we have about the inputs and the processes in our data pipelines, in our DAGs, we can't necessarily trust the outputs. And we shouldn't as skeptical and thoughtful analytics engineers. So I would just say, paraphrasing uh, a wiser man than me, if you have not created a model, a test, a source, and description, you have not fulfilled the mitzvah of DBT. I would hope that all of your projects do meet all of these requirements, these commandments, but we know that's maybe not true. How do we know what DBTers are doing? Well, we've got two data sources that we can use. So there's anonymous usage tracking via snowplow events that are fired when you invoke DBT for a test, for a run, for whatever command it might be. We have over 5,000 weekly active projects out in the world that we get information from. Of course, you can absolutely opt out of this. Check out the docs on anonymous usage tracking to see the details there. And then on the other hand, we've got a lot more detail, a lot more depth about a smaller number of projects. So this is metadata. These are manifest.json files from DBT Cloud runs and accounts. Uh, for those, we've taken a much less than scientific sample of just over 900 projects. So Take what I'm saying and also take it with a big grain of salt. From those two together, I can tell you how many projects have them. Just about all projects have models, about three quarters have tests, just over half use sources. Okay. Descriptions, 
I didn't really feel like unnesting all of that JSON and Snowflake. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'll get you the number later if you really want to know it. I trust that you're describing your models for your own sake as much as for mine. But how many projects actually use these things on a weekly basis? DBT run? Just about everybody. That makes sense. That's pretty much definitionally what we mean by a weekly active project. Testing is only about half, only about 50%. I think you can hear in my tone of voice how I feel about that. Snapshotting source freshness, a lot lower. I would love to see you all doing more and more of that, especially for all the compelling metadata features that it powers. And then docs generate also about half. So I'm going to show you some more numbers for all of the I know, inside baseball fans in the room. If you're really deeply, intimately familiar with how testing works in DBT, I would love to see some guesses in the Slack channel for some of these features. It's, I'm on a couple minutes delay here, so I won't be able to respond to your guesses as you make them, but we'll see how bright you are in a, in a couple. So our sample here is just over 900 projects, just over 100,000 tests, but 75% of those projects use tests at all, just one. For those projects who do, the test to model ratio is about three to two. Okay, maybe it could be a little higher, but this isn't something that we've talked about so much in the past. There are some neat packages and plugins that will help you calculate this. How about one-off data tests? This is something we used to call data test. This is the .sql file in your test directory. Just write a query. If it returns failing results, you're good. What percentage do you think? If you guessed 20%, you're right on the money. Of those who use it, maybe about five per project. That tracks. These don't scale to be reused over and over. These are more for a very specific question you want to ask. Whether a certain customer in the past to make sure that their revenue matches what your previous expectation was to make sure that you didn't regress any logic. All good. Let's talk about generic, formerly called schema tests from packages. This is, could be dbt utils. This could be dbt expectations, a lot of great custom generic tests in there. How many folks do you think use tests from packages? If you guessed high, 18%, again, you're right on. For those who use them, it's about 10% of their tests. Okay, so a slightly higher percentage. If you know to be using these, you're probably using them, leaning on them for a lot of value. How about defining your own custom generic tests? In order to do this, you would have needed to read a really helpful guide in the docs about writing custom schema tests, maybe a macro prefixed test, maybe some magic arguments named model or column name. That's going to be about 15%, but then it's about 20% of the tests in those projects. So again, we see for the folks who are using these, really using them. And finally, anyone who's overridden a built-in generic test. Unique, not null, accepted values, relationships. Not so many, 2%. But if that's something you're doing, you are really doing that. It makes sense. Unique and not null are used all over the place. And the fact that dbt lets you override the built-in version, have it perform custom functionality, meet your specific needs, we see that as a feature. Now, if you're not one of the super users who's been all up in Claire's threads trying to guess your best, uh, guess how many uh, jelly beans are in my jars, that's okay. If you're confused, overwhelmed, you're not alone. There's a lot of functionality available if you know how to use it. And we see that folks who know how to be using it, who know to be using it, are really doing that. We can help here. We can make the options clearer, make the docs clearer, make the trade-offs clearer. And then there are also product foundations that we can tidy up, stabilize. So what's wrong with tests today? They're really finicky to select and to configure. If there's a failing test in a package, good luck deselecting it, good luck turning it off or changing the severity. It actually hasn't been possible in the past to do that. Schema tests and data tests are inconsistent for no good reason. Select star, select count star, how to know the difference. Also, those are confusing names. All of our tests are on data. Sometimes they're about properties of a model, but those properties don't need to be defined in a schema.yaml file. It can be in anything.yaml file. If you want to make super simple modifications to built-in tests, 
like just adding a where filter, that actually requires a whole new schema test or a package to install that has that schema test in it. Severity is one size fits all. There's no way to say warn if more than five failures, error if more than 100. And we live in a complex and imperfect world. Sometimes there are going to be a couple of rows in your table, and you don't necessarily want to fail your whole test just because of it. If you're creating a custom schema test, that's great. The way you do it today is with a macro that has a magic name, a special prefix, and magic arguments. Model, column name, quargs.get column name. Our best bet so far, or in the past, has been to tell you, just look at the built-ins and copy, paste, and edit them. It's hard to feel like this is a rock-solid reusable asset. Finally, if you're trying to debug a failing test in development, it takes way too long. You have to find the right file in the target directory. You actually have to edit the SQL in that file so that it doesn't return a numeric value, but then the rows that you actually want to look at. In any case, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. And our hope, our plan, our aspiration in version 0.20 is to 86 at all. So why tests? Why now? As Barr told you earlier, there's a lot of renewed focus. We're taking metadata very seriously, quality, observability. I'd say DBT, famously the T in the ELT stack, should really be the TT, extract, load, transform, and test. There is no transformation without testing and validation and assertion built in, part of the same process, the same workflow, the same code base. We're also seeing members of the community out there doing really cool stuff. Unit testing for SQL, for Jinja, regression testing during blue-green deployments, all of this amazing extensibility to the built-ins that dbt gives you. And we're not going to be able to meet you all the way there. These are complex problems, and they deserve complex, thoughtful solutions. But we can stabilize and solidify the foundations that you all are building on top of, so that you don't feel like you're out there on your own, without support, we're right there with you. Also, it helps that you upvoted my issue. It makes me feel good. So I've got a GIF here that should make some of you pretty excited. Because of all the foundational work we've been doing for tests in O20, it's going to be possible for the first time ever to automatically store the results of that test, the failing rows, right in the database so that you can, with ease, copy, paste, select, and see failures. If this is exciting to you, let us know in the Slack channel. Let me know on GitHub. This is actually an open PR right now, so it's all the more motivation to get it merged. With all of that, I'm going to wrap our conversation about DBT Core and hand it over to my colleague, Simon, to talk about a more approachable IDE. There. Um, I'm a product manager on the experience team. We think an awful lot about what it's like to be writing dbt code, generating dbt projects in the cloud experience. You may know me from the last staging event or data Twitter, or even the dbt community Slack, which I uh, encourage you to join in the conversation. We've got a lively conversation about this event right now in the dbt demo day channel. So jump in. Obviously I won't be able to answer your questions. I'm talking to you right now, but afterwards <laughs> I'm happy to hop in, look for those red question marks. And those of you who are asking, this is the obvious question. What happened in 1994? The answer is I came in second and the word was rogue, rogue. So it's U E just keep that in mind. All right. What's the experience team. So the experience team does a lot of exciting stuff. And if you're wondering what have we done for you lately, if you've noticed like the new file creation flow within the IDE, that's part of it. We're doing a lot of like bug squashing right now. If you've noticed that when you refresh or close your window, your work doesn't all get lost, that's the experience team. And we're also really focused right now on fewer infinite spinners. And when you see a spinner that it lasts for a much less uh, amount of time. So that's something we're excited about and, and something we're thinking about. 
the big thing that I kind of want to talk about today is a little bit of a broader theme. And it, it ties into what Jeremy was talking about, this sense of confusion and overwhelm that I think is pretty common for people who are starting on their journey toward kind of being an engineer of any kind. We're obviously thinking specifically of analytics engineers, but I think this is a common experience in a broad way. And something I've been reflecting on a lot and something we've been talking about a lot internally to the product org is this sort of, this sort of binary feedback that you often get when you're learning a new tool set. And that binary feedback often is your thing worked and you celebrate, but much more often it's like your thing didn't work, figure it out. And maybe you go to Slack, maybe you go to Google or Stack Overflow or any of our other sort of community resources. But the problem is like, this is a really judgmental experience. And for folks who aren't like really familiar with and like inured to that kind of like punishing feedback cycle, it can be really uncomfortable. And we're trying to think about how we can go to a space that is less about judgment and is more about helping people to level up without necessarily seeking like outside, outside judgment, outside guidance or all that. Yeah. And the way that I've been thinking about it and the terminology that I've been using is the idea of coaching. That is a good coach sees where you're at, sees how you're doing, and then displays for you the brighter future ahead right? Displays for you the ways that you might succeed that you aren't currently succeeding. A good coach reveals the unknown unknowns to you and lays out a path to like achieving those, right? To a place where not only are you observing complexity, but you're engaging in complexity and doing complex things yourself. And this is a real thing that, that I'm worried about a lot is thinking about, we've got this cloud experience that is in some ways really promising experience for teams and especially like larger teams to start working together. And how do you get folks who today maybe don't think of themselves as engineers in any real sense? And in six months, in three months, how do you get them to really step into, identify with, and start to operate as analytics engineers? And it, it's a hard question. Okay, so we're talking really abstractly and strategic here. I, I promise we're gonna we're gonna zoom in on a fractal and start to talk about much more tangible things. Just bear with me. There is at least one other reference to Friday Night Lights in this talk. So if you appreciate this one, you'll appreciate it more in a second. So the, some of the troubles that we have is like, how do we, ah, there we go. How do we think about this in a way that is useful for everybody, right? Like we don't want to simplify the interface or simplify the experience in a way that makes it annoying or not helpful for people who are already quite advanced. What we want to do is we want to create some kind of new middle ground experience that is both welcoming, that coaching experience for folks who are earlier on their journey, but also like additionally useful and like efficiency gains and other sort of improved tooling for folks who already are sort of a little bit farther along in their journey. Another thing that's pretty important to me personally is that we stick with um, this sort of foundational value of, of Fishtown and, and of DBT broadly, which is like code is the language, right? Like code is the way that we express ourselves in this space. And we don't want to go to a series of buttons and we don't want to hide the complexity and the potential of DBT commands. What we want to do is expose them in a way that is encouraging and isn't like evocative of like fear or anxiety for the newer folks. A, a metaphor that we've been using a lot is metaphors guide our life. Metaphors guide our thinking. And a metaphor that we've been using and banding around a lot is this idea of like training wheels versus balance bikes. This is not a stock photo. This is my son. And he's very excited about his balance bike, right? And the reason that a balance bike is meaningfully different and like importantly different from training wheels is training wheels mistake the core competency of riding a bike, which is you get training wheels on your bike and you learn how to pedal really fast. But pedaling really fast isn't the hard part, right? The hard part is like learning to balance. And so thinking about how to combine all these ideas into a better experience within the IDE, especially is really this sort of the idea of like, how do we make this a foundational experience? Not just for people who already know how to use the command line, right? How do we do this? How do we make this a foundational experience for people who like, don't even know what all the different DBT commands are, because in some ways the experience of the IDE historically has required a certain level of familiarity with a local development environment, with the idea of a command line in order to find success and bridging that gap. And then also bridging it in a way that makes it useful, helpful, valuable for more experienced analytics engineers as well. That was, that was a good trick. Okay. That's the strategic part. Let's look, let's zoom down into the much more specific part. You should see a video. There it is. So this is the ID. It looks, should look familiar, I hope. 
And you'll see, this has been the traditional experience of it. You, you trying to figure out what kind of command you want to write. You're like, oh, I know I want to run this particular model. Is that one underscore? Is that two underscores? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's mm, probably two underscores. Okay, let's do it. So I go down, I'm trying to, I'm maybe a new analytics engineer. I'm working in a, a project that's maybe not super familiar to me. And I try to run a model and okay. Error occurred in the server error. Oh no, <laughs> this is not good. Um, I should contact support. Anybody know what happened here? Why, why did this fail? If I contact support, what are they going to say? You need a, a dash M, you need a dash dash model. Come on, get with it, dude. But how would I know that? There's no messaging here to help me understand that. Okay. And so what is that experience like? That experience is like being an Olympic gymnast and you can imagine, all right, here's the sign. Here's your score. Your score is that you made an error. <laughs> better luck next time. See you in four years. And we really want to get away from this, right? Because this doesn't tell you how to do better next time. So this is what the command line looks like today. We pop up what we're calling this sort of like command drawer with recent actions, which are populated by like your 50 most recent actions. You can up arrow to them. You can click them. Really familiar if anybody has used the terminal. And then we've got what we think are common actions. The neat thing about these common actions is they're going to filter and repopulate based on what you're typing in and what you've got in your active tab. <clears throat> so if I've got metrics calculated, it's in my active tab, looks good. I don't have to try to remember how many underscores I have because it's going to automatically populate into this command bar. You can imagine this is the kind of thing that is going to be additionally useful for those more experienced analytics engineers. You can see we've got four most common ways to run models right there, ready for you, little descriptions. Maybe not helpful for super advanced folks, but if you've never seen these commands before, this is a great way for you to understand what you're going to be doing next. You can imagine this is the kind of experience. This is a very, this is a sort of minor micro fractal version of this much broader idea of like, how do we be better coaches? Like how do we use the IDE, not just to do work, but to build better, more experienced analytics engineers. I'm really excited to talk to y'all about it. We've got this breakout session in a little while. I'm going to be in there. I want to hear what you think about this coaching idea, maybe how you've developed analytics engineers in your own organization. I'm just really excited to talk to y'all. I'm also really excited for y'all to hear from the newest member of the product team. Thank you so much, Julia, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Schottenstein. I'm the newest member of the product team here at Fishtown Analytics. And I'm super excited to be here because I've been a member of the community for a long time and I've been at previous staging events and coalesce. So it's super fun for me to be on the presenting side. Before Fishtown, I was an investor at a venture capital firm and I was so excited about the power of DBT and the power of this community that I really wanted to be a part of the team that builds the future of analytics engineering. So I'm the PM of shipments. What does that mean? We're here to help you operationalize your DBT deployments with ease and confidence. So a few of the areas that our team touches is the job scheduler, CICD, Git integrations, data warehouse connectors, webhooks, and yes, coming soon, environment variables. Okay, so one of the things I love so much about DBT is we allow you to test your code and test it often. One of the features I really like is run on pull request. So what that allows me to do is every single time I open up a pull request in my GitHub, I can run a DBT job that will build and test my models. This is really awesome because I know now, before I merge my code to main, everything's going to work as expected. We have 300 cloud projects that trigger DBT job automatically on pull requests. This is really a best practice. So if you don't do it yet, we highly encourage you to check it out. But up until now, that was only available to our GitHub users. And we're super excited to bring this to GitLab users as well. So our team's been working super hard at bringing GitLab webhooks. DBT is tightly coupled with Git. We let analytics engineers work collaboratively without getting in each other's way. And now you can have the full benefit of DBT CI if you're a GitLab user as well. So let's go into an actual demo. Awesome. So here we have the DBT Cloud IDE. And we're gonna go through every single step so you know exactly how to kick off a run on pull request. Let's go over here into the jobs tab. We're used to seeing jobs that run on a schedule. We're gonna create a new kind of job that's run on merge request. So we'll call this run on MR. 
For environment, it's still a development a deployment environment because it's a production job. I'm going to show off some functionality that we built in SlimCI. So we'll defer this job to a scheduled job. So this is the last successful run of our deployment job schedule. This tells DBT only build the models or the files that have changed since our last production job. Awesome. So now we can enter in our commands. We'll do dbtc select state modified plus dbt run dash models state modified plus and finally dbt test. What the state modified plus tells you, that's also part of SlimCI, just tells dbt I only need to change the files and models. I only need to run the files and models that have changed since the last production job. So that all looks really good to me. We have all our commands and we can go ahead and scroll down to run these jobs instead on a webhook. Okay, so we can unclick the schedule, go to the webhooks tab and click that run on pull request. Now we should be all set to have a new job that will run every single time we open up a merge request. Let's see if we can kick this off. Okay, we'll go back to our develop environment. This is a classic Jaffel shop. If you haven't done DBT Learn yet, I highly recommend it. You'll learn a lot. We'll go into our orders model. And the orders model has a lot of great things. It has your order ID, your customer ID, it has some information about how you actually paid for that order and as well the total, total amount. But what it's missing is a status and we'd really like to expose that information to our end users as well. So let's add orders.status. Okay, great. So we'll hit save and our orders model is at the end of our DAG, so no other model should be affected. So when we run this job, this will be the only model that changes. Let's hit commit, added status to orders file, orders model. And then we should be able to open up a pull request. Great. So this navigates us over to GitLab. This is where we can actually give a little bit more details in our merge requests. We can create merge requests here. And here's where the interesting things start to happen. So as we can see in GitLab now, we have this pipeline with a pause button. What this says is we can't actually merge our code to main until DBT Cloud has successfully run and has told us that everything looks good. So in the background, what's happening is GitLab has kicked off a webhook to DBT Cloud. And we can go into DBT Cloud to actually see that job running. Here's our new job that we just built run on MR. You can see it's queued up and running. It's gone through a bunch of the steps already. We have completed DBT C, DBT run, and it's on its final step, DBT test. And we'll give it a second to finish. Okay, awesome, all of those were successful. So if we go back into GitLab, we now see natively that little status bar has turned to a check mark because DBT Cloud was successful. And you can get all this information directly in GitLab. So you feel really confident that when you merge your code, it's doing as what you expect. The last thing I wanted to show off is DBT actually builds these models in a temporary schema. So you have a temporary schema that matches your merge request. And you can see here only the orders model was built. That was the only table that changed. This is because SlimCI knew not to rebuild all of our other models in this project. That's really exciting because it reduces the resources of your data warehouse and also increases speed. And you can expect the data here, we see that the status has actually been included and everything looks as we'd expect to see it. And that's it. Now we have all that we need to know and a lot of confidence to merge our code back to main.
When we hit merge, our temporary schemas will drop so that we don't clutter your data warehouse. And we're looking really good and confident that when we run these jobs in production, we'll have successful tests passing as well. Awesome. So let's go back to the slides. So I hope you liked that demo. One of the other things that we're shipping is native GitLab auth. You'll need to set up native GitLab auth in order to do GitLab webhooks. Uh, and so this will be available to you as well. And you can switch over instead of using uh, your, a URL for your GitLab repos today. Looking to the future, what's coming next? So our team's been working really hard at webhooks and we've been having a lot of fun with them. And we think there are lots more cool things that we can do with webhooks within dbt cloud. So we've heard you, you want not only run on pull requests, but run on merge. We also are excited about this, so we're going to bring that to you all as well. And we think there's more we can do as well. Certainly in metadata, we can do some interesting outbound webhooks where we push data about what's happening in your DBT cloud project to other services. And I was also talking to a user who does some more advanced transformations in Python, and he wanted to be able to kick off a DBT job whenever that data lands in his data warehouse. We think that's a really good use case also. And if we build really important incoming and outgoing webhooks, that will continue to make DBT Cloud the center and core of your analytics stack. If you have ideas about run on PR or webhooks, love to hear from you in our Slack. We're excited to be working on this as well. And that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Drew. But to wrap us up, today, we're at least before the sort of breakout sessions, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the product roadmap at a high level. This session goes out to uh, Allison in the, in the Slack chat. I've seen more people getting engaged in here, posting your thoughts, uh, a little bit of a dearth of memes. So if you want to get them in, we've got about 14 minutes. Let's make it happen. In order to talk about the future, we need to uh, reflect upon the past. Hopefully y'all can see this GIF. Uh, weekly active DBT projects over time. Without the label, you could also imagine this as like number of cups of coffee I've consumed. Um, curious what else you think this uh, chart might be plotting. So we've shared this before. DBT's adoption has grown at about 10% month over month for five years now. And if you do the math, that means that adoption triples every three years. In a really fascinating way, if we look at the chart, we just crossed this 5,000 weekly active project threshold. The thing that this chart is showing us is that there will be 10,000 projects at the end of 2021. And that's a little bit bonkers. It means half of the people that are going to be using DBT, or at least half of the organizations that are going to be using DBT by January of next year, aren't yet using it. And this informs, this informs a lot of our thinking about improvements to the existing product and sort of net new innovations that we should be making too. So onwards, upwards. Okay. So quick recap on where we left off after the last staging event three months ago, we talked about building the foundation. That remains the uh, key goal that we're working towards for, for this year. Uh, that manifests as like performance and reliability, stability, scalability, all the abilities that we'll be talking about. Jeremy talked to us about performance improvements that are in progress and really inspiring. We're doing a lot of work around ma making a more reliable and stable DBT core and cloud. Since the last staging event, we've shipped these API service tokens. More on that soon. Metadata integrations, for instance, the metadata API integration with Mode Analytics, that we're really excited about. We talked about opening new doors, so exposure, Slim CI, those are in the past now, they exist. We hope that you're using them. They're out there in the world with more to come in the future. And as Julie alluded to, we're thinking a lot about outgoing and, and incoming webhooks and how DBT and DBT Cloud can be part of a bigger orchestration story in the modern data stack. Last thing, we talked about the importance of closing the feedback loop. And so we said last time we were going to do more betas, we we're going to keep doing staging, put out more pre-releases out in the world. And some of the folks uh, maybe in this chat got access to pre-releases either of DBT Cloud or DBT Core. If you're not in the pre-releases channel on this Slack, you should totally join to be notified of, of the pre-releases for Core. And we're definitely all here at staging for the second time. We haven't canceled it yet. We continue to want to hear from you if there are things on your mind about uh, how we can make DBT even better or how we can help you be uh, as successful as possible with it. So I want to drill into when we say that we're going to build the foundation, working for the foundations this year. We think about that in kind of three different ways. Increasing speed and stability. This is automatic in context to where scaling through data team and workloads. We think about complexity where you want it. 
So simple isn't always the goal. Some of the work that we do in analytics engineering is just complicated, but we do want to make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. And finally, uh, making DBT the center of gravity. DBT is really central in this modern data stack, and it presents a really great opportunity for us to create a sense of order out of uh, what could otherwise be chaos. So if you were around for my talk at, at Coalesce this past December, this is what I was getting at there. We want things to feel a little bit more like Syrah and a little bit less like Picasso, where the different tools in the stack are able to talk to each other. And then there's some sort of coherence and, and order around your data and how it's being used. We think DBT is going to play a big part in that. Going deeper, here's our vision for speed and stability. Earlier today, we heard from Jeremy that there are 2,430 DBT users at least that have had to wait for more than five seconds for a DBT run to start building their models. That's too many people. And we value your time. We know that you value your time. Some folks have waited significantly longer than five minutes. We took that seriously when we became aware of it. We've really invested a ton of effort into it to date. And we appreciate you sticking with us as we roll out these investments to, to really ratchet DBT's performance to a place that we're all happy with. The key thing here is virtuous cycles and, and not growing pains. We'll revisit that uh, a little bit later. So making this look a little bit more like a roadmap, here's what's on our um, radar for speed and stability and, and, and scalability. One of the things we're researching right now is how long it takes to kick off a new run in dbt cloud we took a pass here earlier in the year and we went from a, a not great place to a much better place but we really think that the faster these things happen the tighter your workflows are around dbt so we're targeting a sub 10 second time to run metric is what we call this for a new job to start running in cloud once triggered. In terms of what we're developing at this very moment, we're thinking a lot about the IDE performance. So Simon alluded to spinners that you might see in the IDE. I can tell you that that Connor, our CTO, recently had a baby. Good for Connor. Happy for him and, and his wife. But Connor and I made a decision uh, back in 2019, I think, to use a specific file system called EFS in the IDE. That helped us get things off the ground pretty quickly, but it's leading to undesirable performance characteristics these days. So we're diving in really deep. We're trying to implement sort of new architecture and, and, and new design patterns on our end. They're gonna help make every IDE interaction significantly snappier. The goal is for the IDE to yeah, get out of your way when you're saving files or, or running models and let you focus on writing the code and, and doing the engineering. Additionally, the IDE leverages dbt core under the hood so all these performance improvements that we see in dbt core are totally going to manifest in latency inside of the cloud ID. Secondly, we've got cloud API v4. I debated if I should make a joke about this, but it feels a little bit like France declaring a new republic. It's just something that we do every couple of years. It's a new, it's a new API. No offense to anyone calling in from France. So we've got API v1, v2, and v3 out in the wild. We've grown dbt cloud to support new use cases. The API has evolved organically. And we're really at a place where we just cannot document and commit to stability on the existing guys because of how they're architected. And so we're fixing that with API v4. It's going to be totally standardized. It's not going to be surprising in ways that maybe the existing APIs are surprising sometimes. Documented by default, stable, reliable. And the goal is to make sure that folks can develop on top of DBT Cloud. We can integrate with um, either homegrown tooling that you might build yourself or other tools in the space that want to push information into dbt cloud or get information out. We're going to do that with API v4. Other big thing we're working towards right now is dbt version 1.0. dbt is significantly more mature than its version number would have you believe, but still we want folks to be able to build on top of dbt with confidence and certainty that it won't change from out, out from under you. So to that end, we're going to solidify these interfaces, really commit to stability, hit that 1.0 uh, number and I look forward to celebrating that that achievement with our team and all of you as well. That'll be a big milestone. And uh, we talked about this a good amount today. We've got changes shipping really very soon. Recent pre-releases, past releases, future releases around DBT course parsing performance. I'm excited about where we're heading there. Okay, the next tenant: complexity where you want it. This is making easy things easy and hard things possible. And again, the goal is not necessarily simplicity. We try to solve a lot of problems in analytics engineering that are just very complicated. Our goal is to make it so that you don't have to think about the easy stuff as sensible defaults. And one of these things we think about a lot is these kind of escape hatches. So if you do need to do something non-standard, custom based on your needs, making sure that's possible and that you can extend DBT in the way that you need to. So in this arc, some of the things we're researching are around both development and deployment workflows. So in the deployment workflows, we're thinking about environment variables in dbt cloud, like Julia alluded to. We're also thinking about a sort of universal dbt build command that's going to allow you to version control maybe the different resources in your project that should be run. 
So hopefully in the future, it will be a choice if you choose to enumerate uh, DBT uh, test for your sources and then uh, a DBT seed and a DBT snapshot and a run and another test and, and your source freshness uh, source freshness generation. So point is pushing a lot of this into version control gives us more uh, of an ability to review these things and, and help bring the benefits of Git to even how we deploy DBT. We're excited about the build command. We're excited to leverage it inside of DBT Cloud. The other thing, we're really early in this process, but I'd be so excited if folks have sort of areas of interest to, to dig into, but we're thinking about things like IntelliSense and code navigation. So if you're looking at a model file in an editor, what kinds of information can we surface within the editor about maybe the refs or sources in that model? How can we help you navigate between the source code? I think there's a great opportunity to do this in the IDE, and it's something we'd be excited to support in a, in a way that folks can leverage regardless of how you're developing uh, dbt code. On the developing front, uh, very much in the same vein as dev tooling, we're going to work towards putting a DAG in the IDE. The DAG that you might be familiar with, in fact, the one we're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, hasn't changed too much in the past couple of years. In some ways, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But in other ways, we've learned so much since then. We think it's a great opportunity putting the DAG in the IDE to really help surface information about downstream impacts of changing a model, creating a sense of confidence of, okay, if I change this thing, what else needs to change? Or something upstream broke, what does that mean for this model? So keep an eye out for a beta rolling out. We're excited to continue development here and, and put it in front of folks and get some feedback. And on the deployment side, we talked a little bit about this GitLab integration and in general, thinking hard about the different Git providers that DBT Cloud integrates with. And to date, we've targeted GitHub and GitLab, but there are certainly others out there. So if you've got a Git provider and you'd love one of these build on pull request type integrations, we'd love to hear from you, your kind of use cases there. And Jeremy talked about Testing, that should be shipping pretty soon. Moving on ahead. Last tenant here, making DBT the center of gravity. These are all the illities that we talked about. DBT is primed to solve a number of problems in the space between the data and the organizational knowledge. It's very much the mission that we're trying to address with Fishtown Analytics as a company. So our existing transformation modeling and testing infrastructure really uniquely positions us to tackle or in other ways assist with data orchestration, lineage quality, observability, discoverability, and more. When you see data orchestration here, the takeaway should not be, oh, cool, DBT is going to become Airflow or Dagster or Prefect. That's not exactly the goal. Instead, we recognize that there's broad orchestration, whether it's explicit or implicit based on like time-based schedules. We want to make sure that DBT is ingesting the right metadata to orchestrate things correctly and also pushing out the right metadata that will help other tools in the stack understand what's happening within the data warehouse. I'm going to breeze through this, just being mindful of time. The key thing here is virtuous cycles, not growing pains. So the more DBT you use, the more we want you to get out of it. We're researching outbound webhooks and orchestration broadly. Very early phases, thinking about things like data observability and discovery. But those are pretty exciting trends. On the development front, we think integration is really very key here. We have this integration with Mode Analytics. We're excited about other such integrations that kind of might come to fruition in the future. And we're building out these kind of more sophisticated access controls in DBT Cloud. So if you are making DBT the center of gravity for data in your organization, you can get all the right folks involved in, say, your DBT Cloud account with the right permissions in order to manage your own kind of compliance and security requirements. Last thing, like always be shipping. If DBT is going to be the center of gravity, it needs to be stable. So we're going to continue to work towards our DBT version 1.0 goal and DBT version 020.0 is the next slide along the way. Last slide, I promise, before I say thanks to all of you, this is a throwback from 2019. The key challenges that we enumerated were scaling accessibility, managing complexity, increasing leverage, and achieving scalability. I think it's good and resonant that these are still the things that we think are like our North Stars. And you even see hard things feel easy and impossible things feel tractable. The, the language changed, but the goals are the same. So I'm excited to keep uh, marching down this path with the product folks that you've heard from today and the broader Fishtown Analytics team. We appreciate you being here with us throughout. Whether you're a DBT, DBT user 10 or 10,000, we do really appreciate you being a member of this community, sharing your knowledge with us, telling us what you think and how we can make your, your analytics engineering workflows even better. So. From here, we're going to jump into some breakout rooms. I appreciate you uh, hanging with me for the, the feverish pace there, but we got it all in.